Hi there and welcome to this video presentation for Long Dean School on the subject of COVID-19. My name is Richard Blackshire and I'm currently the archivist for the school. This video is going to take you through how Long Dean School coped with the pandemic known as COVID-19. When COVID-19 struck the UK, of course, the school, Long Dean School, had to do something about it. The government instructed all schools to implement certain procedures and Long Dean School obviously had to do the same. We're going to talk to some of the people that were around at that time, talk to them and understand how they coped through some very, very difficult times. But let's first look at those newsreels from 2020 to 2021 to understand how this pandemic came about and how it became a worldwide issue, how it became prevalent within the UK. COVID-19 started to appear in Wuhan, China late in 2019. The virus soon became a problem. People became ill and many started to die from this mysterious disease. So quick was the virus to spread that China had to build additional hospitals to treat their population. New hospitals were constructed within weeks. We have a new name for the coronavirus. The World Health Organization has officially called it COVID-19. Co for corona, vi for virus, D for disease and 19 because it started last year. The name though of course isn't the most pressing concern. On Monday in China, it suffered its highest number of deaths in one day. 103 people died just in Hubei province alone. The overall death toll in China is now over a thousand. Good evening. The latest UK case of coronavirus is the first to be contracted within the country rather than abroad. The man walked into a GP surgery in Surrey feeling unwell. It came as another patient who'd been quarantined on a cruise ship in Japan became the first Briton to die from the illness. The respiratory disease, which causes pneumonia-like symptoms, has infected almost 84,000 people in more than 50 countries. And although the vast majority of cases remain in China, the virus is now spreading faster outside that country. During March 2020, Boris Johnson came on the television to give us this stark set of information concerning coronavirus and how it was going to affect the whole of the UK. And it's clear that coronavirus COVID-19 continues and will continue to spread across the world and our country over the next few months, we've done what can be done to contain this disease, and this has brought us valuable time, but it's now a global pandemic, and the number of cases will rise sharply. Indeed, the true number of cases is higher, perhaps much higher than the number of cases we have so far confirmed with tests. And I've got to be clear, we've all got to be clear, this is the worst public health crisis for a generation. I must level with you, level with the, the British public. Um, more families, uh, many more families, are going to lose loved ones before their time. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. Because the critical thing we must do to stop the disease spreading between households that is why people will only be allowed to leave their home for the following very limited purposes. Shopping for basic necessities as infrequently as possible. One form of exercise a day, for example, a run, walk or cycle, alone or with members of your household. Any medical need to provide care or to help a vulnerable person. And travelling to and from work but only where this is absolutely necessary and cannot be done from home. With a sharp increase in COVID cases across the UK, Boris Johnson once again comes on the television to inform us that schools must shut. So looking at the curve of the disease and looking at where we are now, we think now that we must apply downward pressure, further downward pressure on that upward curve by closing the schools. So uh, I can announce 
today and uh, Gavin Williamson is making a, a, a statement now in the, in the House of Commons that after schools shut their gates from Friday afternoon, they will remain closed for most pupils, for the vast majority of pupils, until further notice. So, I mean, the whole COVID situation was um, was a strange time, to say the least. Uh, and in education, uh, it, you know, it, it had impacts that I think we're still probably seeing now and will do for a number of years. Um, so when it first appeared to be developing into something that would uh, would affect school, um, obviously there was a lot of planning that went on, uh, a lot of, there was a lot of confusion. Uh, no one really seemed to know uh, what the um, sort of health and safety implications would be in school. No one can give us definitive answers as to uh, how we manage the site and so on. So one of my roles um, outside of teaching is that I'm involved in uh, in the union so I was involved in uh, looking at what we were going to do with the school um, and I know uh, as things got worse um, that um, it, w it was very unclear what the government actually wanted schools to do so um, that was uh, that was probably um, some of the most difficult times at the start when uh, we were trying to work out what uh, what we could do to make everyone safe obviously and to uh, to respond to what was um, happening and um, you know we uh, uh, we went <laughs> uh, very slowly forwards and um, you know tried to take the advice uh, of all the all the uh, relevant um, organizations and uh, and so on so um, that was uh, that was at the start um, we uh, very quickly went on uh, on to uh, online lessons when the actual lockdowns kicked in we uh, we as a staff had to um, be very um, sort of quick on our feet to change things I mean we we effectively almost overnight had to reinvent teaching almost it was um, it was a very strange time uh, in that respect but also um, you know in in a number of ways it was quite exciting to be able to suddenly look at different ways different technologies that we could use things that we had been starting to look into um, uh, online platforms uh, teaching things in a in, in a very different way to what you would do in a classroom um, and uh, it was incredible actually to see staff you know some who were uh, incredibly technophobic um, suddenly becoming experts in um, multimedia lessons which was incredible to see actually um, so uh, that in terms of innovation um, was amazing actually and I think to this day still we've th there's certain things that uh, made us uh, reimagine how classroom should be and what sorts of things we could do so if we've got students who are out of lessons now we've got a whole suite of things that we can employ that people are pretty confident with um, and I think in terms of technological improvements in, in teaching it probably moved things forward 10-15 years overnight almost so uh, in that respect it was uh, um, it was it was quite a time so um, uh, in terms of the students obviously it, that was uh, a lot of our biggest concerns um, lots of the teaching staff obviously are, are parents as well so um, you know the, the worry about homeschooling and uh, you know running your own um, affairs as well as uh, you know trying to provide a service a public service to a lot of uh, quite vulnerable students was a was a major major concern um, I know we had the um, students in from day one uh, school never shut it was open did some amazing things actually uh, and there was a lot of feedback that we got uh, I, I ran a um, a very comprehensive survey that went to all stakeholders um, after the uh, the first set of lockdowns and uh, I think we got something like 800 responses so staff parents students um, and it was uh, it was amazing actually uh, parents particularly were, were incredibly grateful for what Long Dean did um, and a lot of that was was down to Graham's leadership um, from day one he, he understood 
um, that communication was was essential. You know, everything had unravelled almost overnight, and he was very clear from day one. He, he sent things out to staff and parents. So even though we weren't together as a staff body um, for large chunks of time, uh, when when all of the uh, um, the lockdown started kicking in, the, there was always a presence in school. There was always um, a, a, an email. You know, raising awareness of what was going on, uh, some fantastic work that was done, a lot of, um, you know, supporting. Uh, disadvantaged families providing food even to staff you know we because we couldn't get things at that time and the school used its um, purchasing power and its connections to uh, to help people get things like I remember pasta being a, a particular thing that sticks in my mind for some reason I don't know why um, but you know on that front making masks in the technology department uh, which went to uh, local um, uh, care providers and the NHS. It was amazing uh, what the school community did, um, and you know, just shows the measure of uh, of this school and this school community. Really, I thought it was an incredible time for things like that to actually show what uh, what good education can do. It was uh, phenomenal. Um, yeah, so it was. Uh, I mean, it was a bit of a revolution, as I was saying uh, before, to to suddenly go from the classroom where you've got very very defined. Um, ways of doing things the, the students expect certain things in lessons to um, overnight reinventing everything um, how to um, how to run things like teams lessons um, how to get all the students um, in to start off with uh, you know coming up with routines you know how how do you answer do you put your hand up do you type answers um, to uh, different ways of engaging things. I remember um, people becoming very uh, creative with things like um, whiteboards, online whiteboards, so that the students could actually draw responses live, and you know you can put that on screen and share it with with everybody. We we used a lot of uh, things like the Oak National uh, Academy, which had um, sort of blended learning videos and activities, which were really good. Um, uh, what I I certainly found was the um, it was great in terms of creativity because I could really run with certain things and quizzes and um, a lot of fun things uh, that you you might not normally do in a normal classroom, um, which uh, which was interesting. Uh, I felt um, it was uh, amazing to see some of the some of the students who wouldn't normally speak up in a classroom felt very comfortable being at home and uh, and responded much more positively. But equally, there were some students who um, effectively disappeared for periods of time. We we just didn't see them. It, it's not the same as uh, in in lessons that you would you know if. We we were in school. Everything would be followed up to the um, um, to the you know the the, the tiniest um, kind of level. Uh, so um, during lockdown, we had to give a bit more leeway because we knew there were some things. You know, some students were having a, d a very difficult time. Uh, staff, obviously, as well. There was um, the concern over mental health and well-being. People being um, quite remote. Uh, whereas normally inside school, you know, they're surrounded by people all of the time. So we saw a, a number of issues like that. Um, so it was, it was, it was very worrying with some of the students, uh, which obviously was followed up. Um, and uh, like I said earlier, I think we're still dealing with the um, uh, the effects uh, of that kind of period of uh, enforced. Um, change uh, that, that people went through there were some uh, tough times for a lot of students I mean in my own family that we had some uh, some issues uh, with uh, you know uh, people really struggling uh, with uh, with the lockdown uh, impacts um, and uh, that was no different in school as well um, so um, you know the, all this creativity and uh, and teaching the teaching kept going right the way throughout that never stopped school was, like I said was always open uh, we never shut we, we had students in, so we had uh, vulnerable groups of students in from day one, uh, which was fantastic um, to know that they were safe being educated and so on uh, were some of the uh, some of the lessons maybe uh, that was one of the big uh, lessons that came out of it that um, the more vulnerable disadvantaged students probably needed an even even greater um, sort of focus which I know is one of the big learnings uh, one of the big um, things that we learned sorry um, 
having having been through everything. Like I said, the big surveys that we did um, that came out that came across quite strongly uh, that it was uh, the school did some amazing things um, with you know a large percentage of the uh, of the student body uh, and parents and families uh, which was wonderful um, but uh, things like access to IT at home we've now got a completely different system uh, we have a uh, purchasing scheme students in year 7 8 and 9 all have the ability to buy um, a, uh, a laptop which is used in school now uh, we know that some of the early surveys we did a lot of students were having to share access to technology so we gave out hundreds of computers we uh, you know we, we did a lot of pretty amazing things to ensure that at least we had we gave people the opportunity to still be educated and still to do what they needed to do so um, yeah so in terms of, uh, of lessons there were some of the things that that we did at the time uh, that I think have, have hugely impacted um, the way we teach now um, and uh, also, you know, it was uh, it was interesting actually speaking to students afterwards. Uh, I'm a sixth form tutor, and uh, talking to some of my uh, my tutees after all of this had uh, died down um, was quite interesting what they said about how lessons were online uh, that they would be in bed and they'll type a couple of things wait for the teacher to start rambling on as I am right now and uh, uh, effectively they were um, sort of half in the lesson most of the time so um, one of the, the strongest things that came back from all the surveys we did was um, particularly from parents actually that they one of the, yeah one of the biggest things that they felt was just how important it was for students to be in school and, and the students felt that when they came back in it was like a sigh of relief that they had a bit of normality so um, you know online lessons great um, but there is nothing quite like actually being in the classroom and that's probably the biggest um, thing that came out of COVID overall you know the technology is wonderful we can use all these amazing things to still engage people but nothing is the same as being in the classroom The Education Secretary Gavin Williamson says the government's approach to reopening schools in England will be cautious and based on scientific advice. But he warned that the longer schools are closed, the more children will miss out. It comes after teaching unions expressed concerns over plans for some pupils to return to schools in England from the 1st of June. A further 468 deaths of people who tested positive for coronavirus in the UK were reported in the past 24 hours, taking the official death toll to 34,466. With more, our education editor, Bramwyn Jeffries. Classrooms empty now in England, but in two weeks' time, a few children are due back. Schools are getting ready as best they can, changing classrooms, contacting families. Parents will choose whether to send their children and some think it's time to start going back. Ministers point to Denmark, where children began their return a month ago. But today, teachers' unions here raised concerns. Too many cases, too little testing, among their five priorities. I think that's when the aircraft landed coming back from China and saw the footage of people going to Milton Keynes Hospital. That's when I knew it was it become real because Milton Keynes Hospital was just up the road from where I live. And that suddenly made me think, hang on a minute, that might actually have a, an impact on the things that we're going to be able to do because once you're, you've got a virus that spreads in the way that that one does where it infects people before the carriers are severely ill that's the most dangerous type of pandemic a pandemic where it infects people after they're really ill you know the people are really ill so you know to stay away from them um, so that's when I thought this is going to start to have an impact on the school um, then once we started getting government directives about sort of the, the hygiene aspect of school I thought this is going to start to have an impact and then once we went into the 
we sort of got the indications of actually going into a lockdown once people have started to get sick across the school and across the country that's when I thought that's going to have a, uh, an impact on us and that's when I started to think about how we can spin up things like the remote learning um, remote learning for us wasn't a particularly new concept we'd been kind of on the leading edge of the Moodle development group for things like e-learning across um, decorum uh, this was kind of that that was e-learning where people could access it as and when they wanted to once we started to spin up things like the teams learning we've got an entirely different set of um, sort of protocols to follow in terms of how you organize that and how you can inform people when they're not allowed in the building of how to access the learning so we started to do things like record training videos. I ran a number of training sessions across Teams with colleagues about how to use Teams. But for some of our colleagues, they're gifted in their own field and the way that they teach in their own field, but they're not gifted in e-learning. I'd got a, a bit of an advantage because of my computing background and also kind of the remote learning support that I've done with students down the years. Um, so when I come to sort of head up the way that we, we do the remote learning, it was a question of you know who, what, when, where, how, why. It was making sure the students had got access to the facilities because we've got a number of computing facilities in school, but suddenly these weren't available to students outside of school. They're available in school to students of who are uh, children of key workers, and so we've got those facilities running in school. But it's getting the facilities that we have, things like the laptops, out to as many different people that needed them as possible. Because um, you've suddenly got people accessing remote learning systems on a variety of devices that you wouldn't have usually used, for example mobile phones, things like games consoles. Um, so it's making sure that people have got as much access to the e-learning facilities as possible and then it's training the staff on how to deliver the e-learning. Um, on a platform that they weren't necessarily used to so it's a lot of phone calls and sort of phone conversations to get people up and running in order that we could then train them on teams it's getting them to access teams in the first place um, once we'd spun up the ability for teachers to start delivering lessons by remote and teach them how to share their screen how to set an assignment how to issue virtual work how to collect in virtual work for some that wasn't much of a jump because we did that already for some that was quite a leap um, so bringing everybody up to speed with the e-learning was, was a very steep learning curve for some and then it's how we still continue to provide our pastoral support for students who we couldn't necessarily go to visit. We could go and talk to them on the doorstep, but we couldn't sort of get any closer than two meters to support our most vulnerable students and students with the the, the particular needs that set that they have. Um, that pastoral support has continued as we, we've come out of the pandemic. COVID hasn't gone, um, but in terms of the way that we still support um, people with issues that they faced during the lockdown. For some of our students it was a lovely lockdown. Um, they'd got, they were at home, they felt safe, they felt comfortable, they were ready to learn, they had the technology support, they had the, the family, familial support of, of around e-learning and that for them was, was, was a good experience. For other students where you'd got several people that were trying to learn at the same time on a limited number of devices, on a limited internet connection, while parents were trying to work at the same time, that was a more difficult and more challenging scenario. So it, it really, it, it was a broad spectrum of experience for, for learning in lockdown. Um, once we managed to get the kit out, the right kit to the right people, we then looked at things like um, mobile internet connections, things like our Wi-Fi dongles, um, how we supported parents by topping up credit on mobile phones or contract um, dongles and, and connectivity, because connectivity then became king to learning. And not all of our families had that level, level of connectivity. Um, not all of our staff had that level of connectivity and so then it was kind of bolstering internet connections where we could providing additional support and additional resources um, as well as the work we did around the physical resources um, we, we, we take learning equipment around to people's houses we, we'd um, donate food to various people I mean the work that we did with like Watford General where we were supporting the, the 
staff there um, through to things like making the PPE equipment. We, we, we got to the question, as we always do, of what more could we do? Um, and we were looking at you know food banks for um, students and families um, because not everybody was in a position where they'd be furloughed, not everybody was in a position where they could go to work and then for some people if you get sick you can't earn and so we, we were supporting people pastorally in all sorts of, of different ways, just a, a vast number of ways. Um, the advice we had from the government at the time we followed stringently, um, could that advice have of, I, I guess the more we knew about how the virus spread, the more bespoke the government could become in terms of the advice of, as to how to proceed and how things like when we'd have um, bubbles where students had to be sent home because two or three people in a class had gone down and when you looked at how closely they were sat against other people and you saw these patterns emerge of, of how the infection spread um, I think the more knowledge we had, the better equipped we were to manage situations like that. Um, we then got the ping ping demic, as it became called, where we got the. That might be an edit point, mate. Oh no, there we go. Um, we then got the ping demic, where various different people had their mobile phones go off to say that the people next to them had been infected. Um, we were then sort of not fighting against that system but trying to mitigate the the impact of that where if one teacher had been pinged then we looked at their classes um, we then looked at the, the colleagues that they would have met with during the day um, all whilst trying to maintain a safe distance and trying to keep students it was really really alien to have students two meters away from you it's it's kind of the opposite of the experience that we normally have of, of staff being in the mix with students and helping and supporting them and that's kind of helping and supporting them almost by remote but in the same room um, we then moved into blended learning where we would have students that were off with covid or staff that were off with covid but the classes that were in school um, there was a time when i was i was running the lesson in person and i was running the lesson by remote at the same time um, and that blended learning approach was great until it came to things like practical subjects where I couldn't necessarily lay on the same practical experiences we had in school but I could get the students who were at home to participate in that using the, the webcams that we'd got um, so we'd kind of have a virtual extra group running a practical at home virtually using things like simulations of circuit simulations and chemical, chemical reaction simulations and things like that to try and give them kind of the best experience we could in the circumstances we were in. Um, we then got to the point of blended learning with staff being um, isolating because of COVID, but their classes being in. And so it was teachers that were teaching by remote when they were well enough to support the students. Coming out the back of that, we then had the teacher assess grades, which was in one way, it was a very fair system because for some of our students being put on the spot in an exam hall for two and a half hours to be tested on what you'd learned in the last five years, didn't actually bring out the best in them whereas a teacher assessed grade where we'd assess them so rigorously and had our assessments verified by a number of local schools um, meant that we actually for some of our students gave them a really good experience in terms of making sure that we were assessing um, their abilities over time um, our, our tag process was as fair as it could have possibly been because we sought advice from all sorts of different places. We had the work that the students had done being verified by other academic institutions. Um, those students in that exam experience didn't necessarily miss out. I think it probably enhanced the way that we, we operate. And I'd, I'd like this, part of me that would like to see as part of the post-COVID learning, a return to that where teachers' judgments are trusted because we are fair to our students. Um, some other post-COVID learnings are things like staggered breaks and staggered lunches. We used to have lunchtime all together. As year group bubbles returned to the school, we would then have staggered breaks and staggered lunches. That's something that we've maintained as we've come out of the 
the worst of the pandemic, where we've got um, a few year groups at a time having their lunches together and then staggering that. And that's part of our learning coming out of, of that. Things like um, PE lessons, where students would spend 10 minutes getting changed, getting ready for PE, and then spending 10 minutes, spending 10 minutes afterwards, you end up with a kind of 40, 45 minute PE lesson in between. Now students arrive at school in their PE kit ready to learn for the day, um, P have got an enhanced experience. So there's small learnings of things like that. Um, I think the, the longer term impact of the pandemic are things like when I put my DSL hat on, we've got so many more students reporting so many more things. We've got so many more notifications from children's services, from social services, from the police. Um, as, as just as a crude metric we've already had more alerts this year so far than we had in the entirety of last year and the way that we respond to that is the same as we would have done pre-pandemic um, but the sheer volume of it has, has been such that we we are supporting students in a number of ways um, that pre-pandemic th those reports weren't simply there whether they were the incidents were always there and weren't reported or whether there were more incidents i think over time that would be borne out um that's kind of a flavor of how long dean have, have dealt with the pandemic this week i want to talk about covid19 and children we are at a defining moment for the world's children and young people. The decisions that governments and partners take now will have lasting impact on hundreds of millions of young people and on the development prospects of countries for decades to come. Governments around the world are having to decide whether children can be at school. It's one of Joe Biden's top goals. It should be a national priority to get our kids back into school and keep them in school. It's the same in the UK. There's nothing I want to do more than reopen schools. And most children want to get back to. We've lost a bit of the mentality to want to learn because last time we were all heads down doing it and now it's like, well, how long am I going to be doing this for now? I think there are lots of things that make it really difficult to learn at home. People seem to think that it's just a similar idea of school. You go on an online class when you're supposed to be in class and then that's fine, but it's much more tiring than that. Of course, in an ideal world, everyone wants schools back. The issue is how to do that safely for children and for staff. A number of teachers will still be concerned and perhaps feeling a little bit as if they are the canaries in the mine. And so the question remains, how to educate children in a pandemic? I'm going to look at the science around COVID in schools, the different options available to governments and the impact right now of children being stuck at home because it's hard to overstate the importance of getting children back to the classroom. Here's the WHO. They're a hugely important part of our social, educational architecture. They're the baseline of our civilization. Um, and, but we can't turn schools into yet another political football in this game. Uh, it's, it's not fair on our children. It's also hard to overstate the scale of what's already happened. This is the UN's children's charity, UNICEF. The sheer number of children whose education was completely disrupted for months on end is nothing short of a global education emergency. Bad. That, well, when it initially broke out yeah. and um, the government issued like a warning and everything and said, you know, don't go outside, don't well, so, so for this and stuff. I was pretty scared because I actually thought I'd die. But obviously that wasn't the case. Um, for me, I, I didn't really mind because like, I'm a computer scientist and, you know, stereotypically, we don't leave the house. And I've got a pretty good computer at home, a very good computer, good internet, so it didn't really affect me a lot, uh, the initial reaction of COVID. But when it comes to schooling stuff, it again didn't really affect me because I knew that I, I have the ability to work at home quite well and in fact I did an extra GCSE because I was able to work at home and that shows like how much I do treasure working at home I was able to learn a whole GCSE whilst during COVID lockdown initially when um, we didn't come into school I was completely fine I was more than happy to not come into school but um, I realized as I went on that I didn't know anything to do with my exams and 
Well, I was essentially screwed in my exam. No, not really. Because I, I, I kept in contact with them over like my phone and webcam chats and stuff, but I didn't go out and meet them. Likewise, um, I, I'm, I've always been a, a, person on the, a person on the computer and I always just talk to my friends on social media platforms anyway, so it's not that much of a change. I think a vast majority of us are like able to be completely fine with just doing it online. But I know there probably is a small percentage that it really affected, that they couldn't go out and see friends, probably detrimental to their mental health and stuff as well. 100% agree with you as well. Like there are people who maybe don't have uh, as much tech as we do, and um, they obviously struggle talking to each other and seeing each other like real time. And obviously, some people really need that support from their friends as well. Yeah, definitely. For me, I logged I logged onto Teams, uh, did the lesson, um, sat there, took notes, just like just like how I was in class. And um, some lessons, like maths lessons, for example. Uh, since I've covered all the GCSE math stuff early, that actually gave me the time in those lessons because obviously it's quiet, everyone's on mute. I can then revise a new GCSE, which I decided to do on top of that GCSE further maths. And having that online lesson and having everyone quiet in the class, being all on mute, made me do well in my GCSE further maths and actually allowed me to take an extra GCSE. I think it was like completely opposite for me because I went into my class, joined the call didn't take any notes or anything. I, I'd, keep, I'd keep the voice of the teacher playing in case he called on me, but I'd just watch YouTube or go, to, or go back to bed, to be completely honest. But, um, nearing the end of uh, the year, I was like, okay, I should probably start doing some work, but by that time it was too late anyways. Uh, My yes. sleep schedule was pushed back a little bit, yeah. as in like, I didn't yeah. need to sleep as early, because um, I basically wake up at eight, ten, uh, ten, 10 minutes past eight and just attend the lesson there. Yeah, um, I'd go to sleep really late and then wake up properly at any time of the day. But obviously when I'm in need for my lesson, I'll wake up, join, go back to bed. And uh, yeah. I definitely feel like it was a, it was definitely an experience to come back into school after not being in for so long. It felt, it felt like coming to a new school, to be honest. Yeah, for me, uh, I, I was gonna. I knew. I predicted this when before when the government announced that we we're all returning back to school. For the first week, I told all my friends this, and they all agreed with me. For the first week, you're gonna enjoy it. But after the week, you wanna go back to online learning. <laughs> yeah, because you're gonna because you can finally see each other, finally see your teachers, and after that, that dies off pretty quickly, yeah. and you wanna go home. No, because the the learning that I missed out on when I sort of didn't attend the lessons like I should have. I learned it quite quickly and I think most of the people in the nation probably didn't revise as much as I did and so the grade rounding was brought, was brought lower so it was a lot easier for me to get a better grade, attend and make sure they get yeah. everything that they need. Yeah and since like I've obviously read ahead there's some lessons where the teacher's going over something like a concept in physics let's say momentum for example I've seen it and done it already obviously in class when the teacher's looking at me I don't want to be rude and just like start zoning off and doing my own stuff but like in on team since I've already done it in my opinion there's no point in me doing it again so therefore I can then spend that time revising something else I'm a nerd like that so <laughs> <laughs> take emergency seriously I think it's a lot more serious. Yeah. yeah, same, yeah. I think when it initially came, I was like, it's, it's, not gonna, it's got nothing to do with me. I'm not going to catch it. I've caught it twice now, and it was horrible. It was the worst. So, um, yeah, definitely take it more seriously. And make sure that everyone listens to the procedures that they put in place. Just keep everyone safe, because it's no good having it. My mom Concerned? actually... My, my mom was in a different country when it started. She came back and caught it. And after that, she um she got rid of her symptoms, but she was like, uh, I think she experienced like disassociation and stuff, and a lot of other medical things that I I wasn't aware of. But it can really affect someone, I think, and definitely in a household. Um, I I just live with my mum, and uh, she is a computer scientist as well, and therefore, since if you're a computer science during COVID, in my opinion, your job really didn't get affected because you can work at home really easily. And uh, all she did is she now still to this day works at home because the company realizes that working at home is just really easy, especially if you're working computer science, just set up a remote connection. And uh, she's been working from home since the start of COVID. Same with my uncle, he does it the exact yeah. same. 
in the Another thing that I was able to do during uh, lockdown was a lot of extracurricular activities because I was so future focused ahead that I knew that in the future I would need to write my personal statement for my university. And uh, during like some pointless lessons, sorry, PE for example, one of them, uh, I just did extracurricular activities and wrote a, um, you know, a book uh, about uh, AI. And that's now my personal statement because I was thinking about my personal statement back then and having this lockdown allowed me to have more time spending on my future applications for like university and jobs and stuff Brilliant. than pure academics. Yeah. You both got places at university? Yes. Yeah. So where, where are you going to? Uh, I'm studying computer science and AI at Bath. Right. I'm accounting and finance at Durham. Well, I wish you luck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>and it was kind of just the whispers and the talk on the touch lines of are they going to close schools when will when will rugby start again is this going to be the last game we have for ages and i was talking to another colleague who is a deputy head at another high school and we were sort of trying to pick the date if you like and we're having those conversations about what we may do and then on the tuesday uh, we got into work and it was announced that schools would be closed from the friday for the foreseeable future at which point you start planning of oh my gosh what are we going to do so I think initially the guidance was, was quite sketchy and I, I make no judgement about that because everybody was trying to find their way and it was new for everybody. I think we tried to adopt sort of two approaches really which was the practicalities of what we can do to make sure that kids are being given academic input that they can engage with and then there's maybe also the more moral and cultural element of what you try to do of supporting individual and community level with the with the many communities that you engage with and I think very much Long Dean School was not unique in that you were trying to find your own way through it so initially we adopted the approach of putting activities to do on show my homework and many of our other platforms and we shared our school email addresses with all of the school community so that there was a, a dialogue there between school and home that could be maintained. We also then introduced ideas such as a weekly phone call home from your form tutor just to keep in touch and, and touch base. But there was very, very little face-to-face -face or what is now called remote learning in those early stages because nobody had ever really given it any thought. From day one, we opened our school to vulnerable students and key workers and we had a, a key group that were in every day around that and we 
had a rotor of staff so that staff had some element of normality in their in their working pattern of keeping in touch with colleagues and being in the place where they where they work we also tried to communicate on a daily basis with with parents and with staff in that I wrote a, two bulletins every day. I wrote one to teachers just to keep them informed of what was going on, some of the emerging issues in, in school and I also wrote a daily one to, to parents and I also wrote weekly to the, to the young people themselves, the kids from the school to make sure that they were okay and, and that they knew what was going on as much as we did. But it really was in those first days suck it and see and just find your way through something that was unique. So I think in the early days we did and I think all schools did the best that they could because it was such a new thing and I can remember one of the things I wrote to the students and the parents was that every generation gets called upon to have to serve and to step up and to do something that will never ever happen again in their lives and for this generation of young people it was responding to Covid and we made it very clear that as a school we were there to support them we were there for them to reach out to if they if they wanted to and that we I guess were a, a place of normality in terms of structured guidance there was very very little in those early days for us to build our own plans upon but that got better as, as time progressed. We got better at understanding remote learning and how that would work. I think everybody had a crash course in Microsoft Teams as we decided that was going to be the best platform to deliver learning on. And then we gradually increased our offer. We started off with one live lesson per week per class. And then we gradually stepped that up to, to three or fortnight and then eventually we were delivering a, a timetable, if you like, remotely. And then that throws up another load of, uh, of questions about internet capacity, bandwidth, access to devices. I think Longdean School gave out over 500 laptops to, to students who didn't have um, equipment and facilities at home to engage in learning. As a school we did a remote shop where we drove the minibus around delivering consumables to, to families that requested it. Um, we did food parcels for staff. We, staff had the ability to order, parents had the ability to order food through the school and then come into school to collect it. So it really was thinking on your feet and always just thinking about what more can we do, what more can we offer, what more can we do to help. And it was always striking that balance between the practical, things that people need, and maybe that more cultural element of, of engaging with your communities and, your, and the people that you work with in line with the values that you have as a person, as a whole school. I think there was an overwhelming sense of gratitude that they could touch base with people they were familiar with beyond their own family. And I think that relationship element, which has been a real foundation of Long Dean School, it was really important that that was established and continued and reaffirmed as much as possible, as early as possible. I can remember when I was teaching, you know, A-level uh, philosophy and ethics to an to a all-girl all group of of students and they you know became a standing joke that yeah we're still in our pyjamas sir you know we're going to go back to bed as soon as we finish your lesson but actually in many ways that was refreshing because that was the same approach to engaging with me as their teacher that they would do if they were in school the difference I think was probably the the method of delivery the way that students learned but underpinning that you go back to the relationships which are a real strength of Long Dean School was something that we sought to retain and build upon throughout the pandemic. I think that was again a, another return to sort of uncertainty and then you start to find your way through and it was certainly um, coincided with maybe an, an increased expectation and demand is maybe too strong a word from what parents and students wanted of their teachers because underneath all of that 
there was a real worry about what their exam results would be. And at that point, we started to think really carefully about what online delivery looked like, how we can make the best of the technology to give the kids the best learning experience. And we had some real sort of experts that led that across our school. In terms of the exams themselves, whilst there was some real ambiguity and vagueness about what was going to happen and the timing of the decision, we made the best of it. You know, Sarah's, Sarah Embry as the deputy head led on that. The staff really engaged in the process and, and did it to the best of their ability. As a school, we always place the, the young people front and centre in our decision making. So the uniqueness of our curriculum means that we have students who entered exams early. It means that they have results that were going to count for them, but weren't going to count for the school's public facing data when we returned from the pandemic. But ultimately, we adopted the position that the students had worked just as hard as everybody else for their grades. They were entitled to those grades, they earned those grades, there was a process and we're going to ful fulfil that process and we'll almost worry about the impact of the school for subsequent years when, when we cross that bridge because ultimately life was hard enough for the kids at that time, they didn't need another kick in the teeth of saying sorry you're not going to get the grade you've worked so hard for. What was really pleasing was how strongly our middle leaders and our teaching staff stepped up to make sure there was enough evidence to uh, assess the students that they really engaged in moderation the triangulation and the collegiate approach across our school and between schools within the east of Hemel was really refreshing to see um, and it's actually something that's continued since we returned to education after then. So we were really fortunate that I guess during the periods of lockdown if you, if you sort of caught Covid you were at home anyway um, so there was a real willingness from staff that if they couldn't make a lesson they would still record something on Teams for students to do and they did that and the students could engage in it. I can remember it being really really hard in that period leading up to the second lockdown when you know at, at some points we were sending home 50 to 100 children because they were seen as close contacts of somebody who was a confirmed case we would have kids who would come into school because they wanted to be in school um, but then would develop symptoms so you're sending them home and you're sat there with seating plans and I think the most staff we had out at any one time was sort of 20 to 25 adults not necessarily teachers but again staff and students are very resilient they're very student focused and they do just step up and do what they feel is right to manage themselves and and support the kids i think with hindsight it's always easy to say timings of decisions could have been made earlier information could have come more swiftly um, but from a school perspective i think everybody was finding their way through as they as they went whether that's government down to school down to teachers down to students you you find a way and i think when you lead an organization you can't just choose to lead the easy ones you have to lead what what comes your way at any given time and that includes the difficult ones and there's no doubt that covid was unique that covid was very challenging but that's what you do you, you find a way and I think yes with hindsight if we could have had earlier information more detailed information better access to ICT a clearer path through examinations yes all that would have helped but were the people doing that necessarily always in a position to do that I don't know and that's probably not for me to judge we simply responded in a student focused way, in a community focused way to, to what we had to deal with at that time. I think it's worth noting that the return to school once the, the pandemic was deemed to have passed was in many ways more challenging than the pandemic itself in that maybe there was an expectation that it would all go back to normal really quickly and that certainly hasn't been the case. You know there are challenges about student attendance about 
re-engaging with the way that you had always taught before lockdown and then maybe remote learning had become an entrenched way of delivering education and you have to unpick that to get back to classroom based delivery, engagement in trips um, and those other things that you like to offer young people around their class based learning have, have been challenging and complicated and we're still not there yet but I say you go back to the same principles, those same values and those same sets of beliefs that underpin your culture when you try to find your way forward within that.